When it was the third night, Danyazad asked her sister to finish the story. With pleasure, said Shahrazad, and went on. I have heard, O fortunate king, that the third old man told the Ifrit a more remarkable story than the other two, and that in his astonishment and delight, the Ifrit granted him the remaining share of the blood debt and allowed the merchant to go free. For his part, the merchant went and thanked the old men, who congratulated him on his safety, after which each of them went home. This, however, is not more surprising than the tale of the fisherman. When the king asked what that was, she went on. I have heard, O fortunate king, that there was once a poor elderly fisherman with a wife and three children, who was in the habit of casting his net exactly four times each day. He went out to the shore at noon one day, put down his basket, tucked up his shirt, waded into the sea and cast his net. He waited until it had sunk down before pulling its cords together, and then finding it heavy, he tried unsuccessfully to drag it in. He took one end of it to the shore and fixed it to a peg that he drove in there, after which he stripped and dived into the sea beside it, where he continued tugging until he managed to get it up. He climbed out delightedly, put his clothes back on, and went up to the net, only to find that what was in it was a dead donkey, and that donkey had made a hole in the net. The fisherman was saddened by this and recited the formula. There is no might and no power except with God, the exalted, the omnipotent, before saying, this is a strange thing that God has given me by way of food, and then reciting, you who caught danger, diving in the dark of the night, give up your efforts, do not win your daily bread from God. The fisherman rises to earn his keep, there is the sea with the stars woven in the sky. He plunges in, buffeted by the waves, his eyes fixed on his billowing net. Happy with his night's work, he takes back home, a fish its jaw caught up on the pronged hook. His fish is brought from him by one who spent his night out of the cold, enjoying his comforts. Praise be to God who gives and who deprives. For one man eats the fish, another catches it. He encouraged himself, saying that Almighty God should show favour, and reciting, When you are faced with hardship, clothe yourself in noble patience that is more resolute. Do not complain, then to God's servants you complain. To those who have no mercy of the merciful. He freed the donkey from the net, which he then wrung out before spreading it out again and going back into the sea. Invoking the name of God, he made another cast, waited until the net had settled and found it heavier and more difficult to move than before. Thinking that it must be full of fish, he fastened it to his peg, stripped off his clothes and dived in to free it. After tugging at it, he got it up on the shore, only to discover that what was in it was a large jar full of sand and mud. Saddened by the sight, he recited, Troubles of time, give up. Stop, if you have not had enough. I came out looking for my daily bread, but I have found there is no more of this. How many a fool reaches the Pleiades? How many wise men lie hidden in the earth? The fisherman threw away the jar, wrung out his net, cleaned it, and went back a third time to the sea, asking God to forgive him. He made his cast and waited for the net to settle, before drawing it in, and this time, what he found in it were bits of pots, bottles, and bones. He was furious and shredding bitter tears, he recited. You have no power at all over your daily bread. Neither learning nor letters will fetch it for you. Fortune and sustenance are divided up. Our land is fertile while another suffers drought. 
Times change bring down uncultured men, while fortune lifts up the undeserving. Come deaf and visit me, for life is vile. Falcons are brought down low while ducks are raised on high. Feel no surprise if you should see a man of excellence, in poverty while an inferior holds sway. One bird circles the earth from east to west, another gets its food but does not have to move. He then looked up to heaven and said, O oh my God, you know that I only cast my net four times a day. I've done this thrice and got nothing. So this time grant me something on which to live. He pronounced the name of God and cast his net into the sea. He waited until it had settled. Then he tried to pull it in, but found that it had snagged on the bottom. He recited the formula, There is no power and no might except with God, and went on. How wretched is this kind of world that leaves us in such trouble and distress. In the morning it may be that things go well, but I must drink destruction's cup when evening comes. Yet when it is asked, who leads the easiest life, men would reply that it was I. The fisherman stripped off his clothes, and after diving in, he worked his hardest to drag the net to the shore. Then, when he opened it up, he found in it a brass bottle with a lead seal, imprinted with the inscription, Of our master Solomon, the son of David, on both of whom be peace, the fisherman was delighted to see this, telling himself that it would fetch ten gold dinars if he sold it in the brass market. He shook it, and discovering that it was heavy as well as sealed, he said to himself, I wonder what is in it. I'll open it up and have a look before selling it. He took out a knife and worked on the lead until he had removed it from the bottle, which he then put down on the ground shaking it in order to pour out its contents. To his astonishment, at first nothing came out, but then emerged smoke which towered up into the sky, spread over the surface of the ground. When it had all come out, it collected and solidified. A tremor ran through it and became an ifrit. With his head in the clouds, his feet on the earth, his head was like a dome, his hands were like winnowing forks, his feet like ship's masts. He had a mouth like a cave with teeth like rocks, while his nostrils were like jugs and his eyes like lamps. He was dark and scowling. When he saw this ifrit, the fisherman shuddered, his teeth chattered, his mouth dried up, and he could not see where he was going. At the sight of him, the Ifrit exclaimed, There is no God but the God of Solomon, his prophet, prophet of God. Do not kill me, for I shall never disobey you again, in word or in deed. Ifrit, the fisherman said, you talk of Solomon, the prophet of God. But Solomon died 1800 years ago, and we are living in the last age of the world. What is your story, and how did you come to be in this bottle? To which the Ifrit replied, There is no God, but God. I have good news for you, fisherman. What is that? the fisherman asked. And the Ifrit said, I am now going to put you to the worst of deaths. For this good news, leader of the Ifrits, exclaimed the fisherman, you deserve that God's protection be removed from you, you damned creature. Why should you kill me, and what have I done to deserve this? It was I who saved you from the bottom of the sea and brought you ashore. But, the Ifrit said, choose what death you want and how you want me to kill you. What have I done wrong? asked the fisherman, and why are you punishing me? The Ifrit replied, listen to my story. And the fisherman said, tell it, but keep it short, as I am at my last gasp. No, fisherman, the Ifrit told him, that I was one of the apostate jinn, and that together with Sakha, the genie, I rebelled against Solomon, the son of David, on both of whom be peace, 
Solomon sent his vizier Asaph to fetch me to him under duress, and I was forced to go with him in a state of humiliation to stand before Solomon. I take refuge with God, exclaimed Solomon when he saw me, and he then offered me conversion to the faith and proposed that I enter his service. When I refused, he called for this bottle in which he imprisoned me, sealing it with lead and imprinting on it the greatest name of God. Then at his command, the jinn carried me off and threw me into the middle of the sea. For a hundred years I stayed there, promising myself that I would give whoever freed me enough wealth to last him forever. But the years passed and no one rescued me. For the next hundred years I told myself that I would open up all the treasures of the earth for my rescuer. But still, no one rescued me. Four hundred years later, I promised that I would grant three wishes and when I still remained imprisoned, I became furiously angry and said to myself that I would kill whoever saved me, giving him a choice of how he wanted to die. It is you who are my rescuer, so I allow you this choice. When the fisherman heard this, he exclaimed in wonder at his bad luck in freeing the effort. Now, and he went on, Spare me, may God spare you, and do not kill me, lest God place you in the power of the one who will kill you. I must kill you, insisted the Ifrit, and so choose how you want to die. Ignoring this, the fisherman made another appeal, calling on the Ifrit to show gratitude for his release. It is only because you freed me that I am going to kill you, repeated the Ifrit. At which the fisherman said, Lord of the Ifrits, I have done you good, and you are repaying me with evil. The proverbial lines are right where they say, We did them good, they did its opposite. And this, by God, is how the shameless act. Whoever helps those who deserve no help will be like the one who rescues a hyena. Don't go on so long, said the Ifrit when he heard this, for death is coming to you. The fisherman said to himself, This is a genie, and I am a human. God has given me sound intelligence, which I can use to find a way of destroying him, whereas he can only use vicious cunning. So he asked, Are you definitely going to kill me? And when the Ifrit confirmed this, he said, I conjure you by the greatest name inscribed on the seal of Solomon. I ask you to give me a truthful answer to a question that I have. I shall, replied the Ifrit, who had been shaken and disturbed by the mention of the greatest name. And he went on. Ask your question, but be brief. The fisherman went on. You say you were in this bottle. But there is not room in it for your hand or your foot, much less all the rest of you. You don't believe that I was in it, asked the Ifrit, to which the fisherman replied, I shall never believe it until I see it with my own eyes. Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. When it was the fourth night, Danyazad asked her to finish the story, if she was not sleepy, and so she went on. I have heard, O fortunate king, that when the fisherman told the Ifrit that he would not believe him until he saw this with his own eyes, a shudder ran through the Ifrit, and he became a cloud of smoke hovering over the sea. Then the smoke coalesced and entered the jar bit by bit until it was all there. Quickly, the fisherman picked up the brass stopper with its inscription and put it over the mouth of the bottle. He called out to the Ifrit, Ask me how you want to die. By God, I am going to throw you into the sea and build myself a house in this place so that I can stop anyone who comes fishing by to tell them that there is an Ifrit here who gives anyone who brings him up a choice of how he wants to be killed. When the Ifrit heard this and found himself imprisoned in the bottle, he tried to get out but could not. 
as he was prevented by the solomon seal and he realized that the fisherman had tricked him i was only joking he told the fisherman who replied you are lying you are most despicable foulest most insignificant of ifrits he took up the bottle no no called the ifrit but the fisherman said yes yes at which the ifrit asked him mildly and humbly what he intended to do with him i'm going to throw you into the sea the fisherman told him you may have been there for eighteen hundred years but i shall see to it that you stay there until the last trump didn't i say spare me may god spare you and do not kill me lest god place you in the power of one who killed you but you refused and acted treacherously towards me now god has put you in my power and i shall do the same to you open the bottle implored the ifrit so that i can do you good damned liar said the fisherman you and i are like the vizier of king yunan and duban the sage what is their story asked the ifrit and the fisherman replied you must know ifrit that once upon a time in the old days in the land of ruman there was a king called yunan in the city of fars he was a wealthy and dignified man with troops and guards of all races but he was also a leper who had taken medicines of various kinds and used ointments but those illness doctors and men of learning who had been unable to cure there was an elderly physician known as duban the sage who had studied the books of greeks the persians the arabs and the syrians he was the master of medicine and of astronomy and was a conversant with the fundamental principles of his subject with a knowledge of what was useful and what was harmful he knew the herbs and the plants that were hurtful and those were helpful as well as having a mastery of philosophy together with all branches of medicine and other sciences when this man arrived at the city within a few days he heard that the king was suffering from leprosy and that no doctor or man of learning had been able to cure him he spent the night thinking over the problem and when dawn broke he put on his most splendid clothes and went to the king kissing the ground before him and calling eloquently for the continuance of his glory and good fortune after introducing himself he went on i have heard your majesty of the disease that has afflicted you and that although you have been treated by many doctors they have been un unable to remove it i shall cure you without giving you any medicine to drink or applying any ointments yunan was amazed to hear what he had to say and asked how he was going to do that promising to enrich him and his children's children i shall shower favors on you he said and grant you all of your wishes taking you as a boon companion and a dear friend he then presented duban with a robe of honor and treated him with favor before asking are you really going to cure my leprosy without medicines or ointment duban repeated that he would and the astonished king asked when this would be urging him to be quick to hear is to obey replied duban promising to do this the very next day duban now went to the city where he rented a house in which he deposited his books his medicines and his drugs he took some of the latter and placed them in a polo stick for which he made a handle and he used the skill to design a ball the next day after he had finished he went to the presence of the king kissed the ground before him and told him to ride out to the polo ground and play a game the king was accompanied by the emirs chamberlains viziers and officers of the state and before he had taken his seat on the ground duban came up to him and handed him the stick take this he said hold it like this and when you ride on to the field hit the ball with full swing until the palm of your hand begins to sweat together with the rest of your body the drug will then enter through your palm spread through the rest of you and when you have finished the drug has penetrated go back to your palace 
wash in the baths and go to sleep, for you will have been cured. That is all. At that, the king took the stick from him and mounted, holding it in his hand. He threw the ball ahead of him and rode after it, hitting it as hard as he could, when he caught up with it, and then following it up and hitting it again, until the palm of his hand and the rest of his body became sweaty because of the grip on the stick. When Duban saw that the drug had penetrated into the king's body, he told him to go back to his palace and bathe immediately. The king went back straight away and ordered that the baths be cleared for him. This was done and the houseboys and mamluks hurried up to him and prepared clothes for him to wear. He then entered the baths, washed himself thoroughly and dressed before coming out, after which he rode back to his palace and fell asleep. So much for him, but as for Duban the sage, he returned to spend the night in his house, and in the morning he went to ask permission to see the king. On being allowed to enter, he went in, kissed the ground before him and addressed him with these verses, which he chanted. Virtues are exalted when you are called their father, a title that none other may accept. The brightness shining from your face removes the gloom that shrouds each grave affair. This face of yours will never cease to gleam. Although the face of time may frown, your liberality has granted me the gifts. That rain clouds shower down on the hills. Your generosity has destroyed your wealth until you reach the heights at which you aimed. When Duban had finished these lines, the king stood up and embraced him before seating him by his side and presenting him with the splendid robes of honour. This was because when he had left the baths, he had looked at his body and found it to his great delight and relief, pure and silver, showing no trace of leprosy. In the morning, he had gone to his court and taken his seat on the royal throne, the chamberlains and the officers of state all standing up for him. And it was then that Duban had come in. The king had risen quickly for him, and after the sage had been seated by his side, splendid tables of food were set out, and he ate with the king and kept him company for the rest of the day. The king then made him a present of two thousand dinars, in addition to the robes of honour and other gifts, after which he mounted him on his horse. Duban went back to his house, leaving the king filled with admiration for what he had done, and saying, This man treated me externally without using any ointment. By God, that is the skill of a high order. He deserves gifts and favours, and I shall always treat him as a friend and companion. The king passed a happy night, gladdened by the soundness of his body and his freedom from disease. The next day he went out and sat on his throne, while his state officials stood and the emirs and viziers took their seats on his right and on his left. He asked for Duban, who entered and kissed the ground before him, at which the king got up, greeted him, seated him by his side and ate with him. He then presented him with more robes of honour, as well as gifts, and talked with him until nightfall. When he gave him another five robes of honour, together with a thousand dinars, after which Duban went gratefully home. The next morning the king came to his court, where he was surrounded by his emirs, viziers and chamberlains. Among the viziers was an ugly and ill-omened man, base, miserly and so envious that he was in love with envy. When this man saw that the king had taken Duban as an intimate and had rewarded him with favours, he was jealous and planned to do him an injury. For as sayings have it, no one is free of envy and injustice lurks in the soul. Strength shows it and weakness hides it. The vizier came up to King Yunnan, 
kissed the ground before him and said, King of age, I have grown up surrounded by your bounty and I have some serious advice for you. Were I to conceal it from you, I would show myself to be a bastard. But if you tell me to give it to you, I shall do so. Yunnan was disturbed by this and said, What is this advice of yours? The vizier replied, Great king, it was a saying of the ancients that time was no friend to those who did not look at the consequence of their actions. I have observed that your majesty has wrongly shown favour to an enemy who is looking to destroy your kingdom. You have treated this man with generosity and done him the greatest honour, taking him as an intimate, something that fills me with apprehension. Yunnan was uneasy, his colour changed, and he asked the vizier who he was talking about. If you are asleep, wake up, the vizier told him, and went on. I am talking about the sage Duban. Damn you, exclaimed Yunnan, this is my friend, and the dearest of people to me, for he cured me through something that I held in my hand from a disease that no other doctor could treat. His like is not found in this age or in this world from west to east. You may accuse him, but today I am going to assign him pay and allowances with a monthly income of a thousand dinars. While well, even if I divided my kingdom with him, this would be too little. I think that it is envy that has made you say this, reminding of the story of King Sinbad. Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say.